Hello and welcome to Metro AV Tech Tips. I'm Brent. I'm Adam. And welcome aboard. Yeah. So Adam, what is today? Well, uh, today is brought to you by Microsoft and their, their forced updates. <laughs> so it was almost not brought to you. <laughs> it was you almost not brought to you by today. By Microsoft and their forced updates. <laughs> yes. And why is that, Adam? Well, because the laptop that I normally run everything off of is, uh, it decided that literally five minutes before we go live, it's going to do a firmware update. That's going to take an hour. So. For here anybody here watching, uh, if if we if something weird happens, let me know down in the chat. I've got us here on on a, on a backup uh, cell phone. Uh, let us know if something weird goes on. But we're here right now to talk about uh, Hi-Fi, uh, and it's, it's oh, oh, oh sorry about that. There I didn't you realize go. The volume was on. <laughs> we're here to talk about Hi-Fi and its place today and into the future is what we are talking about today. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah, I love you. Tomorrow, well, and that's kind of the idea, right? We're we're finding out it is hi-fi going to be as good or better or less than what is it going to be today compared to what it used to be versus where we're going, and that's kind of the the, the topic for today. I know last week we we talked a little bit about where it came from, some of the cool items that were there, you know, in the early days and, off topic. And, and going off topic and stuff. But hey, listen, as always, guys, if you're watching the video, we really appreciate it when you do leave us comments over in the chat section or down in the comment section below. Even if it takes us off on a wild tangent, we want to talk about things that are important to you uh, that are part of this industry. So as always, if you have questions about whatever it is we are talking about, feel free to leave it over in the chat section and over here. I certainly always appreciate when somebody reminds me they're older than I am. Uh, that's well, yeah. Yeah, sure. There's not enough of that. I, I, I will say that's very difficult to do in some cases. Yeah, so, enough. you know, yeah. Um, but as always, you know, uh, if you're watching this after the fact, leave your comments down in the comment section below. We do monitor those. Uh, and also, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us by email. Uh, I'm actually going to take this here. We're going to flip back over to the other screen so that we can see that. There it is. Email us here. My email is adam.rogers at metroav.com, or you can email Brent at brent.mccall at metroav.com, our new domain name. Yes, exactly. So reach out to us. We did have a gentleman who reached, uh, who did reach out to us uh, last night uh, asking quest questions about IR, um, and I did respond to that. So if you're in, you're in the video today, thank you for the, the email. It's always it, great to hear from viewers. It is truly awesome to know that people find us enjoy what we say mm -hmm. and learn something yeah and then like always like share subscribe hit that little bell notification to let you know when we do go live which of course is every wednesday at 3 p.m and now every friday at 3 p.m for the uh solutions that's right broadcast. exactly so and what is our solutions broadcast this weekend i we're gonna friday? we're gonna talk about the um well, i think we're talking about where did it go here it is this Friday, we are talking about the MHXD uh, cable. Which is a digital coax cable. That is correct, yep. And so that's just an RCA cable, but that also is going to lead into the following episode for that Wednesday. So Yes, now next week is going to be interesting because mm -hmm. Adam has abandoned me. The, uh, yes, the, I am. The, the hardest working man of this team uh -huh. has basically abandoned me. Yep. And said, "You're on your own. I'm leaving, dude." Well, I am leaving in you in good hands. I've got we've got Brandon, our producer here, who's going to be running the show for us. So, Brandon, and that's thank good you for that. Because I have no clue. Yeah. Uh, and but next week uh, I will be gone, and the week after that I will also be gone. So we do have a special guest. Yes, you do. And it's an interesting guest because normally this is not what you think about him being. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's more of his history. his history. Yeah, exactly. So um, you all know him as one of the HDMI people. Uh, that is, the of gurus. course, uh, one of the gurus. He is uh, Jeff Boccaccio from uh, DPL Labs, uh, who we are very close with uh, with our DPL Both certification. Both his friends and physically. Yep, exactly. And so uh, we're happy to have him on the show to be a guest, uh, a guest talking head. And next week is talking about RCA cables and yep. the history. And the week after is? Uh, the week after. What are we talking about the week after? You scheduled I, I do it. This all the time. I do this all the time. Let's see. We're doing RCAs, and then we are talking about. I'm not going to remember it right now. But anyways, um, <laughs> it'll it'll come to me eventually. Uh, but so, with Jeff, because of his long history in both engineering, design, and retail. Yes. Because he owned a, a Mac store, not computer, but Hi-Fi. Arc and E Arc is what we it. were talking about. Arc yes. And e so which does fall within. Yeah. That now. Yeah. Exactly. That does fall into HDMI quite a bit. And so Jeff is definitely the perfect person to talk to, honestly, for both of those topics. He was actually um, little is known about Jeff, but he was part of. Uh, can I can I say it? Where, I don't know. where he came from? Sure. Uh, well, he was part of Macintosh. Well, 
he was very close friends. Very close friends. With Mac and Gotcha. Um, went to all of Mr. Gal's weddings mm -hmm. and got the job because he solved a problem with a Mac tuner. Okay. As an engineering student. Ah. Which upset the engineering team in Mac. Of course. Well, then, then of course and he had to he, he had to start working with the them. So yes. yeah. So um, which is perfect for that because honestly, it would have been good to have him on for the hi-fi as well. But we're he getting him on for the RC yeah, we're getting him on for the RCAs uh, to talk about RCAs, the history of the the terminal itself, the connector itself. Um, so we've got Mark Silver in the chat. Mark, it's great to hear from you. Uh, he says, "Hi guys, uh, did you add a Z amp to the stack finally?" No, no, I haven't been back to the warehouse to pick it up. Okay, but I do have my A fifty one. Yes, yes. And moving this around. Uh huh. And we are a tad bit nervous about our table. So I'm I'm sitting in the other room and uh, and working on at my desk, and all of a sudden I hear Brent holler from from in here. Adam, get in here! I need help. And of course, I run in here, and he's got this, you know, massive monstrosity of a thing that's what, like, eighty pounds. And yeah, and it's more than the old man should be carrying. Uh, yeah. So we're, um, Brent. Why is this here? What are we? You know, um, what what well, are we talking about? With it? Of course. And what is stable in hi-fi? What has not really changed in the last fifty years of hi-fi? Amplifiers. Amplifiers. We have made some gains with efficiency okay. as we've gone from Class A to AB to G in the early 80s, and now Class H, which is class a pure H. digital amp. Okay, so it's not Class D. It's well, Class H. D and H. Okay. But, you know, we're down to, you, and you've seen some of this stuff. Stuart's mm -hmm. played with some of those 50 watt per channel oh, yeah. digital amps, which are just amazing yeah. efficiencies. Well, and, and that's the, I, I think I talked about it on one episode where um, the speakers that I had here at my desk, uh, the it's got, it's a self-powered like studio speakers mm -hmm. and the amplifier went bad in it. And they're not, listen, they're not like. They're not hi-fi. They're not hi-fi. And, but the thing was, is I wanted some nicer speakers than my little laptop speakers. And so I thought, well, let me hook it up and see what happens. And here's the thing, you can, you can pick up a small little tube amp now. Mm-hmm off of some of the online shopping sites. Right. That sounds very good for what it is. We're not talking Jadis or mm -hmm. old Mac stuff, but it still sounds really good. So when you're looking at Hi-Fi, you know, you got your sources, which we've talked about. Right. You've got your control with your preamp tuners, whatever. But amplifiers have been effectively stable for years and years and years and years. Right. No, all they've really done is just gotten quieter and quiet not quieter but quieter the, well, yeah that's the best way to put it yeah, right because the they noise don't... floor has dropped right yeah so you get more of the music and less of the amplifier mm -hmm. now there's still a lot to be said for big mondo heavy power supply amplifiers right versus digital amps right a digital amp will give you the volume and good fidelity mm -hmm. but it doesn't provide the current right and one of the things you and i have discussed many times in relation to hdmi and IR and pretty much everything else mm -hmm. is current. Yeah. Not wattage, but current. Because mm -hmm. current is really what controls the quality of the sound. Wattage will control the volume, but current controls control of how things happen. Yeah, it's the thing that's actually doing the driving. It's so the thing that's, that's the power. The bigger the power supply, mm -hmm. the more current delivery. And you know, you can get, you can get amplifiers. I remember back in the uh, Mid 80s, one of the major amplifier companies, and I think it was Corel, but it could have been Cello. Mm -hmm. I honestly don't remember. Talked about they <coughs> provided so much current that you could weld <laughs> with their outputs. <laughs> okay. And that's a ton of current. Yeah, now you're not using all of that current at no, one time. No, no, and so. here's the thing current, you know, and one of the things we've talked about with speakers sitting in the office, and mm -hmm. one of the things you guys really don't get to enjoy, unfortunately is us just sitting around talking about hi-fi and views and just stuff we keep here. talking about a blog but we're kind of afraid or, of the implications a, yeah yeah exactly doing a, a but podcast I'm old or school, something so for me current is incredibly important that mm -hmm. means a giant toroid big power supply right lots of copper yep yep to make the difference for hi-fi yep now as we moved into digital amps the amps have gotten lighter faster and sound very good. Yep. But the question is, do you give something up? You know, it's the album versus CD, vinyl right. versus digital argument. Right, right. And we covered that in sources, <clears throat> but you know, some of the new sources really, really good in streaming. Yeah. Uh, well, we talked about Deezer and Tidal right. and a few others that are that are at, at that Sony's, really super Sony's, high. Uh, I'm going to vapor luck on it now. That yep. They're HQ. 
player that's got the ultra high resolution. Yes. High res music. Yeah, yeah. So, which those uh, again, we go back to the to what we talked about last time. How um, when it comes to hi-fi audio, the, from the, you have, need to have hi-fi from the very beginning, right? From the yes. source material, the whole thing, all the way to the speakers, right? Right, and it's not just a single thing. Remember, the weakest link in the chain mm -hmm. sets the chain. Right. I don't care if you've got the greatest speaker wires in the world. Mm -hmm. If you've got poor RCA cables or poor source, right, it's still going to sound like a poor source, right. So you know, it, putting it's, Pirelli P7s on your Pinto, yeah, doesn't make it a Ferrari. No, no, it'll look fun. It, it'll look cool. For, it'll look for, cool. For, it'll look interesting at the very least, right? So when we are looking at the so for us HDMI guys or digital guys, the the whole idea of the whatever is the bottleneck of the chain, kind of comes to is is the same thing when it comes to with HDMI like splitters. Yes. So in those cases where we have say we'll we'll keep it simple, we will have a, a 4K source. And we have 4K, 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 and then we've got a 720p TV. So in that case, in most cases, except for you know ours, um, what's going to happen is that it's going to force all the other TVs to be watching 720p 720, because yes. it needs to make sure that everybody can watch. Well, that, and that's its job. And that's its job. Now, the same thing happens, mm -hmm. but not as much so because we're talking analog with distributed audio. Right. So let's say you've got a, a nice... Matrix, an mm -hmm. audio matrix. Yep. And you've got a nice amplifier, you know, not one of those cheesy little chip amps that you buy off of uh, monoprice.com. Right. A real quality product. Mm -hmm. And you've got some good speakers, <clears throat> some not so good speakers, and some great speakers. The nice thing about going hi fi or analog is the analog signal is not going to react to any device specifically. Right. So the crap speakers are not going to bring the great speakers down to their level. Right. True. So if it's hi-fi and you're sending a hi-fi signal and you got great speakers, they're still going to be great. Yeah. Yeah. Crap speakers are still going to be crap, but they're going to be as good a crap as they can be. Sure. They, they the go crap. as far as they're able to go. Right. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mark Silver saying, amps that could be used to weld goes back to the 70s with SAE. Uh, yeah, later, I sold those. Yeah, later and with GAS. Uh, phase linear, yeah. even anymore. Phase linear became Carver. Okay. As Bob Carver. Okay. Product. Yeah. Now Bob Carver didn't he become? Um, he was bought by Elon. Bob by Elon, but what didn't he go on to do? Sunfire. Uh, Sunfire. That's yes. what, who I was thinking of. Yes. Okay. Well, and, and that's one that that I'm familiar with. Sunfire with the subwoofers and and mm -hmm. the the ribbon tweeters and you know all that. Which they didn't do the they didn't create the ribbon tweeters, but they definitely Just implemented them it, right. quite a bit, right? Um, and I do love ribbons. Yeah, yeah. Ribbon tweeters definitely create definitely a, a different sound than just a, a horn tweeter or a soft tweeter. Yes. Um, very cool stuff. And by the way, one of the things that was pointed out to me uh, from our last broadcast mm -hmm. is I did not mention that the soft dome tweeter was in fact patented and created by an American. Okay. Who for a long time lived right up the street in Jacksonville. Did not know that. Uh, Face Tech Speakers was owned by. Um, Bill Heck, I think. Okay. I know his son, Ken. Sure. Um, I actually knew Mr. Heck back in the 80s, but Phase Tech, they were also a manufacturer for a lot of other brands. Okay. But he holds or held, until he passed away, unfortunately, mm. the patent for the Soft Dome Tweeter, which was a major upgrade in audio. Interesting. So when we are... So let's let's then talk about we about the the current state then, right? So Actually, it's wonderful. Is it? Are, are well, we in a okay. good spot right now? Look, if, if, if you're looking at what you guys can't see is an AVR behind this curtain, which is mediocre. Mm. If you're looking at that, hi-fi is mediocre. Sure. But that's not what you're looking at if that's your market. Well, yeah. You, I mean, that you're looking at a surround sound audio system. You're not looking right. at it's stereo. Not really, yeah. It's not hi-fi. No. But in the world of hi-fi, you can still fully support HDMI and all the multi-channels. You've got RCAM. Accurus, Indie Audio Labs, right? Um, Datasat, Storm, Stark, yep. Parasound for amplification, um, Anthem. If I didn't already say it, no, nope. I think I yeah, did. N not, not yet. So, so there are some phenomenal uh, audio control. Okay. Yeah, All of yeah. these are hi-fi products. Okay. That also do HDMI, but first and foremost, they're hi-fi. Which 
kindly <laughs> disinteresting. Yeah, well, it's and it's we've their taken their priority. Occasional phone calls. Yeah, it, it's their priority levels. Their priority is more towards the audio, making sure it sounds yes. good. Which, if that's what you're looking for, is perfect for that, right? And and, and you know, and getting that, that signal. And these products allow you to actually segregate a two-channel system within a multi-channel system. Yes. Which yeah. is awesome. Usually, it's like a second zone or or something or sometimes like that. Sometimes you can you can address two of the eleven point two zones. Mm -hmm. 11.2 outputs to just be the stereo stereo setup. okay and so, so when, when you're doing a, a stereo listening mode you that the, yes. that those are the channels that are being amplified and in some cases it allows you to bypass the full digital processing and just go straight analog path okay so I, I'm, I'm gonna throw one at you. Uh, you you're not prepared for this okay well that's most of my life well, pretty much right okay so when we are looking at oh let's see uh, THTA does that mean anything to you? Oh, the, uh, Theta. 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 There Theta. it is. T H E T A. California company. Okay. Um, Theta goes back to the 70s. They <laughs> made transports, amplifiers, preamplifiers. Right. Phenomenal sounding products. They were absorbed by somebody, and I honestly can't remember who it is. Sure. But they have stayed as, they were one of the first really high end DAC companies. It sounds like Mark, transports. Mark might know. Mark, if you know who they were who they were bought by, let us know in there. Uh, we've got Sline86 saying he turned 66, or sorry, they turned uh, 66 earlier this month. Thank Does you. that mean that they are older than Brent? You, thank you. Uh, yeah, there you no, go. Nothing is older than Brent. <laughs> Even if it is. Even if it is, it's, it's not, not older than Brent. <laughs> uh, let's see, Mark's, uh, the experts are saying Parasound has a surround sound and stereo, pro or slash stereo processor. Well, it's not a, okay. They don't offer a surround sound processor. Mm -hmm. What they offer is a preamp with a 7.2 input off of a external processor, the P7. So, uh, they the, don't the, do any actual surround processing, to my knowledge, anymore. Right. They did. They had the C1, the C2, which were um, their preamp processors. Mm -hmm. And that is, predated HDMI. In is fact, it the Halo P7? Yes. I think it's the P7, and you, what you've got is a multiple XLR and analog inputs. Oh, it's a very pretty part. Oh, it's a gorgeous part. Okay, you know what? That actually brings up a question. <clears throat> black or silver? Uh, well, sure, yeah, okay, black or silver. When it comes to your, your equipment, do you like more of a black or silver color? Because like Marantz, they have like the European versions of mm -hmm. their stuff, or usually like a champagne. silver. So did Luxman. Yeah, and then their, their American market is more of the dark, you know, uh, it's not really black, it's kind of a, a dark super charcoal. dark brown, yeah. Um, but my question actually is, what's the more important side of a piece of equipment? The way the front looks or the way the back looks? Oh, that's, that's an easy one. <laughs> It's the that's way the back sexy. looks. Yeah, that's sexy. <laughs> so, and for me, that's that, that's exactly it. And and it may it's be all about for the base, about the base. You know. <laughs> yeah, right. So the. <laughs> It's my I can't. I can't. I can't. I'm done with the episode today. I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> I have to put up with this all the time. Uh, no. So when it comes to building a, uh, these pieces of equipment into like a rack system. So let's say you you build like an actual because this is rack mountable. This is yeah. you know you can actually put I it mean, in, in fact, the rack in over fact, here. My ears are on it. Yep, uh, and with something like this, the However, front it is of it, a two-man installation. Uh, yes, and I'm putting that at the bottom of the rack. I'm not putting it up anywhere no. higher than, no, because than the rack's shin gonna level. Go. Yeah, exactly. Now with this here, the thing is, is that when you with the, for the cons for the client who's paying for it, yeah, I want the front to look very nice. And it, it right? you know, there were some pieces in the um, SAE which had the really cool lights, but you had some products that were just flat, flat mm -hmm. panels. Um, Knock and a couple others that were not particularly attractive products, right? But super, super durable and reliable. Yeah. However, those days are gone. Now you do have to have yeah an attractive product because if it's going to be rack mounted, yeah, like you're going to show the rack off. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, you know, yeah, it's that's it's the whole. That's the whole. It's one of the main reasons of of putting all this money into yeah. one of the systems is particularly if you're doing you're the custom bringing people over, right? And all, yeah, yeah. Put the, put all that in there. Let's see. Okay. Uh, wow. uh, Mark Silver says he's celebrating 53 years in audio at 72. Um, Congratulations. Thank you, Mark. Um, um, I started in 75 doing car audio installs. Mm -hmm. My first paying gig yep. was 78 with Dixie Hi-Fi. Okay. Which you would not know, but nope. that's okay. Yeah. They became Circuit City. Oh, okay. Now, at the time, were they a chain uh, at oh, the time? Yeah. 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 Okay. And they started off as a mail-order line called Wards, not Montgomery Wards, mm -hmm. just Wards. 
and then they opened and then became Dixie Hi-Fi and sure. they opened up a series of small shops. Your typical shop was not much bigger than these than this bay. Right. Okay. Um, manned by three to four people in gingham shirts and jeans. Gang, gangham? Gingham. Gang, gingham. Not gingham. gingham. It wasn't gingham style. Not 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 gingham, gingham. style. Okay. Gingham. Okay. You know the uh, plaid kind of. Let's see. The experts are saying um, uh, you switch between the modes on the on the Parasound piece. Uh, Mark Silver saying TI or ATI. ATI. Um, and then let's see, Parasol D used to offer a pre that must be pro pre-pro yes they did yep and then uh ken kessler owns theta oh, hey, ati a uh well he's not here but mark silver saying ken kessler owns theta ati sae b and k really wow and mm -hmm. more um i wonder if he's got i mean he must be a super maybe possibly super hi-fi guy maybe and he's just owning he's just buying brands. all these things yeah. up right okay so um Ward's, uh, Ward's company also was CNFW and Zodi's. I, well, in, in the Incredible Universe. No, that was Tandy. It was uh, the loading dock. It was Ward's, Dixie Hi-Fi, the loading dock, mm -hmm. and then Circuit City. Is this what it's like, Brandon, when I'm talking to you about HDMI stuff? It, it, and it just kind of like, you know, if I go like full on in, into like all the details of, of HDMI or whatever other thing I'm working on where I'm just like, does it just like, you know, you, you, you glaze over and you're like, I have no idea what's what's going on? Uh, yeah, basically nod my head to make it seem uh -huh. like a, you're uh, listening, yeah. I'm listening. Yeah. To be yeah. I feel much better about my life now. <laughs> Thank you. Not a lot of comprehension. Look, and, and here's the thing. It's uh, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for going back and learning your roots, where you came from and why we are where we are. And so it's not a bad thing to know these things. And I should probably actually learn these things well, eventually, now, and, right? And let's get back to what we're here about today. Sure. Hi-Fi. Yeah. What has actually changed in Hi-Fi? Mm -hmm. Well, all that's really changed is the delivery. I, I was going to say, How that's where it came from. How it gets to your house. Yeah. Yeah. It used, that's the big change. Used to be on a on a, uh, a, a, a wax record. Cylinder. A, a wax cylinder. Well, a wax okay. Cylinder. If we're going back to the phonograph, yeah, sure. But we're come bring it up a few a few stages, and we're now on a on a uh, vinyl. Flat piece of vinyl. Yeah, pl a, fa a flat piece of vinyl. Um, and it stayed that way for quite a while, and right? And still is. Yeah. There are those of us that have turntables and cartridges and phono preamps sure. and still do that whole thing. And then it, it rolled on through to 8-track or 4-track, 8-track, and then we're up cassette. to cassettes. And then from cassette, we went to CD, right? Yes. And that kind of really started where we're at today is, the, is when the CD well, happened. Well, yeah. And two things happened with the advent of CD. Mm -hmm. The traditional high-end store, the Hi-Fi Salon, started falling out of popularity because anybody could buy a CD and set it up and use it. Mm -hmm. Turntables required interface with the, you had to want, it was a hobby. Right. CD took hi-fi out of a hobby and made it available to pretty much everybody. Well, and, it, and it's more portable. Right. It makes it easier plug, to, you to two use. Wires, you plug it in. Yeah. You're not having to adjust your tone arm. Mm -hmm. Set your balance, make sure the tracking's not too heavy, yeah. clean the record, do the anti-static gun, mm -hmm. which is great for shooting people in the air. So CD took Hi-Fi mm -hmm. out of the salon and moved it into consumer retail. Right. <clears throat> then when we got into the iPods and the streaming devices and the phones, it moved from retail to being a very personal, carry with you portable stuff. Yeah. I mean. This is not high end audio. No, but it ain't bad. No, it's not. And and you know, honestly, I I almost want to, if we had a time machine, right? If you had a time machine and you were able to take those AirPods and you know the the music and whatever back with you to yourself when you were working at these hi fi stores, would what would your old uh, beyond going past the whole wireless communication and everything, going beyond all that, what would your you know younger self you know, what would your response be to those? Yeah, these sound, or would it be, these sound amazing, or would it be, these sound okay, but I've got something over here that sounds much better. Well, and see, there's the thing. Right. The, the, what these represent is just stunning, and it's amazing. Yeah. The convenience, the person, the you know, it's personable. Yeah. But there is something that has been lost with all this. Yeah. First off, if you've got these, a really nice set of, head, you know, well, there aren't any really nice sets of headphones that the consumers use anymore. Right. Now they're just headphones. Right. But you do all that, and it becomes very isolated. 
Sure. It's like going home when you got a family, your kids are on their cell phones, and your wife's watching TV, and you're sitting there on your iPad. The whole communal experience of hi-fi, I think, is gone. Are, are, are we having a are, are we having a a, a boomer um, a little bit. Uh, rant? A little you know, bit. right now, are we? I used to, is, used is to go over to a friend of mine, Cord, Cord Williams' house, uh -huh. and he had a really nice uh, Hathler DH500 amp. Um, uh, I can't remember what preamp it was. Sure. But a really nice piece and some uh, phenomenal speakers, mm -hmm. and we would sit down and just listen to music. Okay. And a lot of now, it's you can still do that individually. Sure. But when you put on headphones mm -hmm. or you go sit in a dark corner in your house, it's now a solitary thing, I think. I'll give you that. And, and I'll, I'll, Speakers allow it to be social. I'll kind of flip it a little bit as well. Because so, um, when I was much younger, my, my parents took in uh, uh, one of my distant relatives or cousins. And uh, he brought with him his audio system that he had developed or collected at the time. This was back in 94. 96 um, cassette tape he had a, a turntable on top and he had an AM FM radio and everything in the cabinets it was definitely not a hi-fi system it was, it was all definitely system. it was a probably an all-in-one compact yeah now when I will say it was they were separate components he did have to wire things together and and like the the reg but it came as a package mm -hmm. he, he, he bought it all as one Kelly kit. Fisher maybe um, okay. I was Six at the time, so I'm not I'm not memorizing names. We won't talk about what I was in the nineties. Well, yeah. Um, so I wasn't six when the uh, w during that time. What, what would happen, of course, is and taking this in any other direction is that he would he was um, at the time he was a troubled youth, and so of course he would use the music as a way to, to isolate himself, isolate by himself, and, it up and being alone. Yeah, and and ticking off my parents who took him in to you know protect him from other things, but. Uh, the point is, is that it was it, having the headphones is a way for today. Anyways, it almost makes it like a, like an easier avenue for people to have that isolation that they're wanting. Absolutely. And then, but also not and having to disrupt the entire. Now, granted, well, he was doing it for the purpose of dis of disruption, but that was another matter entirely. Uh, let's see. Mark Silver says, "I used to manage a CHFW in LA. CHFW? Uh, that was a chain, but I don't. Or CNFW." High five? Something. It, it was California high five. high five is my guess. Oh, probably. Um, and then he says the P uh, stands for passive and the Parasound P uh, or Halo P7 or P6. Okay. So, yeah. Um, anyways, so. I have a P5. Okay. So when we look at the, the idea of the listening experience, you're kind of on, on the mindset or, or the pathway that the listening experience is kind of taking a back seat to just ease of access. Absolutely. Okay. And, and it has. Now, yep. having said that, do a, look, I've got the turntable, mm -hmm. I've got a Sonos, mm -hmm. I've got an Amazon, and if I'm going to just sit down and listen just for... Right, right. I'm going to go in, pick up the remote for the P5, mm -hmm. select input three, and just say, Alexa, play Frank Sinatra. And then just listen to Amazon Music. Now, it's Amazon HD. Of course, yeah. And it's on my BGs. But is it really hi-fi? Um, no. 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 Well, um, because... The Sonos is a, is a step up in quality. Right. But the Sonos, I have to break out the iPad, mm -hmm. open the app, and kind of scroll I mean, through you, it. you could tie it into your Alexa, by the way. I don't know if you know yeah, that Yeah, you or know not. what? My experience has, has been yeah, with Alexa, sure. Sonos sure. In, in, integration. Yeah. It's eh. yeah. Now, and and I would say almost that the and I because also have of the Heos, which is slightly better fidelity. Yes, and I 100% agree with that. What I would say is that the 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 reason that Sonos has taken off like it has is I think that you're right. I think that we've kind of done away with the group, the communal listening, and gone more to the private listening. But I think that there's a demand now being created well, and that's the for Sonos, that communal, right? You know, for for people that are, are not going to, not the customers of our customers. Mm -hmm. Sure. Let's be honest. Sure. Yeah. You know, they'll pick up uh, five or six or eight S1s or S5s. Sure. Spread them around their house. It's not really hi fi, it's just Back on music. music. Yeah. And honestly, that's a wonderful thing. Well, and, and it doesn't sound bad. You know, let's, no. depending on what you're listening fact, to and we where it's coming the, from. The new Echo 4. Yeah. 
from Amazon is sneaking up really close to the S1 for a half the price. Speaking of, can I can I show them what I learned today about the the Sonos Arc? Sure. About the uh, yeah. About actually, the this was this was <laughs> kind of yeah, cool. That's it right there. We did not know this. Okay, so maybe you did. So we have a Sonos Arc here. Um, I, I don't know if you, if you've seen it here in the background. It's it's on the floor here. Um, and uh, and uh, by the way, expert, uh, we can thank the experts for that. Um, but what we have here is this is the the included or not included, but this is the the bracket uh, uh, for wall mounting. Bracket. It is expensive, um, and it's it's not a bad design. It's it's one solid piece, and it's got you know some really nice things to it. Well, I was playing around with it, and it had me that metal ruler there, and I was noticing you know just kind of you know tapping it and whatnot, just idly doing whatever, and I went like this, and I ran it across there, and I noticed that it, it caught along the way. Now this is a metal ruler; it's inside of a sleeve right now. But it caught the edge of it, and I realized that, wait a minute, that's magnetic. So I did a little bit of digging, and, and come to find out, there is... Do a... A neodymium. Do a top... Can we do a top... I can do a top... Here we go, right here. Yeah. We'll do a top-down shot. You thought we weren't going to use top-down today. In How long I am. Yeah, exactly. Underneath the rubber in here is a little neodymium... Or may, maybe neodymium, neodymium. Maybe something else, yeah. Uh, magnet inside of here. So again, I did some more digging, come, you know, to find out what exactly you know wh it was used for. Why is it there? Turns out the Sonos Arc has a little reed switch where that would actually meet up with, and what it does is it causes the Sonos to go into um, one. It tells the Sonos that it's being wall mounted, and it automatically turns on their room equalization feature that uses the microphone and little you know ultrasonic sounds. But there's a caveat to that: you can't turn it off. As long as the magnets are as there. As long as the magnets are there, as long as you can't turn it off. The, arm, yeah. the magnets are there. So, if you are doing an installation with a Sonos Arc, uh, it, you know, come to find out that these tech tips are actually going to be in the middle of the episodes. Um, the if you're installing a Sonos Arc on the 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 Sonos branded uh, mounting bar, um, and you don't want to use the Room EQ for some reason, you have to take out that magnet. Um, which, if you peel it back, you can like push it out and whatnot, and that works out okay. Can you? But can you? Enable the Wall mount. feature on, I mean, the, the room EQ on the yes. app? Yes. Yeah, all of that's, you, you can enable all of that through the app. You just can't disable it. You just can't disable it. the magnet's exactly. there. Exactly, yeah. Okay, oh, one other tech tip. Yes. I came in on Monday and said, mm -hmm. Adam, I was thinking over the weekend because there's IP control of Roku. Oh, yes. Can we IP control a Roku television? Yes. Now, we get a lot of people that are using Roku TVs. Mm -hmm which are TCLs typically. Mm -hmm. uh, the price is right, they're available, and let's be honest, that's a major criteria at this point. Right. And it's like, I know we can IP control the Roku's over Control 4. Can yes. we control a TV? And Adam says, well, strange you ask, because I said, I want you to hook it up and test it on a Control 4. He says, mm -hmm. I don't have to. Let's see if I can do this because right. Because he had already seen a bulletin. If we do this ta-da the uh blackwire um sh shout out to them i uh, the blackwire has this roku tv control 4 driver um which is now you asked the question because we we, we, we know the, the guys of, over at and kevin and and seth and whatnot over there will do crestron and they're working on it mm -hmm. um so you know we'll we'll see if that actually happens or whatnot um here anytime soon so don't hold your breath with that but of course remember Somebody that we are may have it all right um, but the point is, is that they do make uh, the Control 4 one, and it works ridiculously well. It, it honestly so does. So you get power, volume, and all the all the Roku controls right. via IP. Right. Which is now, can you do this wirelessly? Yeah. Yeah, it so works just, wirelessly. So if you have a, a, a Roku TV, or if you have a client that wants a TV out on an outside patio or something like that, where you're like, it, it's going to die. We know that. So let's just put something out there that's cheap. Throw a Roku TV out and there get, for like three hundred dollars or you less. Keep IP control. And you can IP control it. Put a Control Four uh, SR two hundred and fifty or two hundred and sixty or two hundred and fifty two hundred and sixty out there, uh, or just use the the, the Control Four app, app on, on the phone, phone, and you can control it directly like that. It's it's honestly it's great. It's it's fantastic and stuff. We have we have no vested interest in. We honestly don't. We we just like nerding out just, about these things, right? This is just I mean, one of those things. Like, gosh darn it, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, that's cool. Um, okay, well, you know. Where are we There's going? There's a lot of stuff there, there today. Is. And so, uh, um, and a lot of his things, uh, thanks to Mark, he's going in and some of the history on some of the stuff. Um, oh, he's on. <laughs> okay, I got to put it up higher. He's here got. Uh, he, he's talking about. Um, he's uh, he 
keeps mistyping. Convenience over hi-fi quality has uh, convenience over quality has killed hi-fi as a normal application. Yes, but we covered that in sources. Well, in, yeah. and it's going to. So and the fact is, history has always shown us laziness wins. Uh, yes. Now I do believe that there will always be a, a market. market for hi-fi, and, and there will always be the people who and here's want the thing. that. When you look at the number of mm -hmm. Hi-Fi Pre Pros now with the Acuras products, the Thetas, the Datasats, the ATIs, um, Parasound still with their preamp. Right. They're still, and it's not a small market, it's mm -hmm. a growing market. Phono sales, yeah. vinyl sales have gone up. Yeah. There are people that are resurrecting reel to reel machines. Now, mm -hmm. to me, that's a lot of kind of cool nostalgia because I've had several reel to reels and yeah. just something sexy about watching those things turn. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's kind of. One turns a little bit quicker than the no, other one, right? Yeah, this one's going this way and then, yeah, like that. But it's also. Once, well, it depends depending on, on which, which depends yeah. on the fill. Yeah, yeah. Which, which one's fuller or which yeah. one's less, and and they, they're yeah. just it's just cool to watch. Mm -hmm. You go over and you you know those logic controls, the really keyboard ones. And clunk, 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 clunk. So wait a minute, how did that work? Um, okay, first off, um, Steve Barrett says fifty watts per channel baby cakes. Uh, he says sorry, Adam, you are too young. Does that baby cakes mean mean anything to you? Um, Was that like a Baby cakes, the phrase doesn't. No. 50 watts per channel used to be a big deal. Yeah, okay. Um, um, when you were looking at, at tubes, <clears throat> yeah. most tubes fall in the 5 to 7 watt range. And you still get all that? All that well, that current, 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 <laughs> current, current. So a much lower voltage then? No, for... well, first off, tubes are biased by voltage, lower wattage, but okay. higher current okay. and higher voltage through the tubes. When we went to solid state, you know, first off we went to um, MOSFETs, transistors. Sure. And then they went down to chips. Yeah. And in the 80s. And companies that you knew as being really hi fi companies mm -hmm. suddenly had these really lightweight, plasticky feeling things. Right. Which sounded dry <clears throat> and anemic. Okay. And it took years for that to return because they went after the mass market because they were not stupid. Right. But, it, you know, you had a couple of lines like NAD, Luxman, Tanberg, Mac, that eschewed that and did not follow that path. And they stayed, they stayed with they the They stayed the, with the transistors and, and, and MOSFETs. And, oh, okay. Well, oh, they, they stayed with the You know, with tubes the were, when you looked at the 70s, 80s, 90s, the tubes had to come from Russia. Ah, okay. So, when uh, going back to what you were talking about with the reel-to-reel, the -reel, and, and I know that we're supposed to be talking into the future, but... I, I think honestly, I this, think it's cool. This, well, it's cool, and also if people are, are remaking these things, it is a future item. What I'm curious about is, was there a variable speed? Did the system know how much fill was in the yeah, the, the, the lead one? Yeah. Did it? Did it, was it able to tell that? Okay, we need to speed up the well, the, 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 the back take one's, the or back slow one's down not the take. Fed, it's just pulled. Right, but the front one though, because when you start out the front one. Technically, it's, it's running at, it's slower. It's traveling at either three and three quarters, seven and an eighth, maybe, and there was a nine and another speed. I honestly don't remember anymore. Well, and, but when it starts off, it's running. Technically, it's running slower because it's it's right there at the middle. Then, as it gets further out, it's, it's if it's you kept it at the same speed. Also. So as it pulls through, it's the same. It's pulling faster, but the audio is recorded onto it at the same speed. Right. Got it. Okay. So. You actually wound up losing space on the back end of your tape decks or, or your recordings, yeah, a didn't you? Bit more, yeah. So by the time you, you know, if you got a big reel, by the time you get to the end of the reel, more tape is passing over the head at a given point in time. Right. You still have them. You still have the same content within that period of time, but you have more tape, more tape in that period of yes. time. That's interesting. It's trace equalization, baby. I had, I, that's exactly what it is. And and I think when you said that at first, I thought, now wait a minute, hold on, because that would mean that. So either the system automatically did it, or no. they just didn't no, do it. No, 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 yeah. no, 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 no. Well, now, no, no. now today, no, no. or like on on a, and actually the same thing would happen on a record uh, on a on a uh, vinyl then, because at yeah, the middle of it, a, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's the whole concept, right? That you know, a, a, a wheel breaks physics because at the middle of it, it's slower than it is at the out, at the outer edge. It has to go further right. distance on that, but it's all spinning together. So, same problem then, right? You well, you but run it's into not a problem because that's how the data is applied. This is how it's applied. Right. So would you technically have a higher fidelity audio on a track that's on the outer edge of a, of a vinyl than it is on the inner no, edge of the vinyl? No, you're, because you're, you're taking up the spacing's different. Mm -hmm. Slip clutches on the take-up reel. Tape speed is constant. 
Ah, was it maybe based on... Is that Mark? That's Slime. Slime, okay. Slime or Slyn? Um, Slyn. Slyn. Slyn, not M. It's two N's. Yeah, two N's. Yeah, yeah. Two N's. That's what I, I thought I you were saying Slyn. Uh -huh. um, three... It was Ghostbusters. Three and three quarters and seven, seven and, and a half and, and 15. 15. Huh. And then, then you had um, five, seven, nine inch rails and, and bigger reels. One and seven eighths was cassette. And... When you got really slow on reel to reel, uh -huh. it was straight vocal. It was like running 16 RPM on a turntable, which you've probably never seen. Uh, yeah, none of that really means anything to me, so I don't know what that okay, does. Okay, the slower a record turns, sure. the lower the fidelity. Why? Because it's the the actual physical medium is is possibly crushing into what was already recorded. Kind of, sorta. Okay. The faster a record turns, the better the fidelity. Why? Well, and that was my question for for before. Would a track on the outer edge of a of a, a record? It's just it's how the data is applied. Better? When you look at a when you look at a seventy eight RPM, which record players were originally, that disc is spinning very quickly. Mm -hmm. So the data is not here or here; it's here. So right. That data is spread out, so it's more defined in the grooves. Uh, yeah, and, and that's where I, where I was going with that. You know, so you're getting a higher fidelity because it's it's now over a, they do a the longer exact opposite. When mastering tape, they do half speed masters. Okay. Because what they'll do is you'll take twice as much tape. Right. For the same period of time. So it actually Which gives you better like, gives you better fidelity, lower tape noise. Ah. All right, let's see what's going on in, in the chat. Let's see. Uh, Lawrence Lau, thanks for joining the chat. Uh, says tape speed was controlled by capstan and pinch roller. And that's when you look at a we don't have the whiteboard. We don't have the whiteboard. <laughs> Which you, you, you have your reels. Uh -huh. You have your head in the center. Right. You have the tape is drawn over a cap stand and pinch roll. And that pinch roller, two things. This was called the take up reel. And all it did was just spin freely, but there was a little bit of a drag on it. So they didn't uh, overspin. Yes, yeah, correct. Yeah. And then you had rollers mm -hmm. that would guide the tape across the head. Right. So it pulled back. So if, if this is. If the head is here, the tape's actually kind of back here. Mm -hmm. So it has to go down and up and over these drives and pinch rollers. So would the pinch roller then control the speed of the of the tape then? Right, and then the take-up rail just matches that. Right, because it has its own, not clutch, well, it's but it, its own... its own Typically belt yeah. drive. Uh, let's see, so then we've got uh, Nick Danger saying, don't forget 30 IPS constant tape speed. Compensated take-up and supply motors keep the reels at a tight wind. And that's what you were just right. were just describing. Uh, Nick Danger also says standard reel sizes are five inch, seven inch, ten and a half, and fourteen. The, you don't see a whole lot fourteens, but the ten and a halfs, like Pioneer had a RT seven hundred seven and an RT nine hundred nine. Could any of those sizes work on any of any reel to reel tape deck? Yeah. Yeah. Well, as long as it's all standard quarter inch tape. Right. Um, the problem you run into is bigger wheels reels. Mm -hmm. Just physically wouldn't fit on the deck. You had to have a larger spacing. Oh, that was actually set aside right. to it. Yeah. So when you looked at, um, you, know, you could take a machine the size of this right here mm -hmm. and put two seven and a halfs on it. That was a Pioneer RT seven hundred seven. Okay. But for the the bigger reels, you had to have a taller machine so the reels set further yeah. up and away. Just like looking at a jacked up pickup. Yeah. Mark, you, thanks for thanks for joining the chat. We we appreciate you coming in. He says uh, he's got to go. He's going to catch the rest of the show later. Thank um, you. So, uh, let's see, then uh, uh, Sline is saying one and seven eighths was also a reel to reel speed. Yes, um, which but was, it was so very cassette. vocal. Yeah. So, we're kind of back to that. And now, vocal, what does that mean? Are we talking like. Spoken where, records. Okay, yeah. So, so, uh, so if someone was like reading a, uh, a, yes. an, a book or something, then they now would remember, use. Remember, cassette was not intended for music when it was developed. What was it? Cassette was intended for vocals. To for do dictation. Like, like, ah, man, Phillips makes sense. developed the cassette not as a music uh -huh. format. Oh, interesting. Um, let's see. Good catch, Nick. Thirty IPS was uh, was pro only. Um, and then uh, uh, Michael Heiss. Michael Heiss, it's great to see you in the chat as always. Uh, Capstan delivered the motion, but the full path of a tape deck, video or audio, also included the guides and other control arms, which right. is what we were just describing. Now, if you if you ever get a chance to see it. Sony used to have a reel-to-reel -reel video machine. Okay. Now this is back in the 70s. Well, now, it, now are you talking like, like a projection system? No, a reel-to-reel -reel video tape machine. So magnetic physi tape? Yes, physically had, okay. and it was two different levels. It actually trans w you know, went back over flat. itself? No, no, it wasn't like an A-track. Okay. It wasn't a cassette, it, right. you actually had two reels. Huh. So, you know, loaded 
one, this one was slightly higher because it went at an angle against the head. Sure. Huh. And it was black and white. Uh, and it had a, you would um, feed it off a composite signal. Right. Off an outboard tuner. The, typically, the TVs in the schools back in those days, the, the 24s that mm -hmm. were on the big roller carts, which were before your time. Right, right. Had the tuners in them, but they also had a video out. So you could go into an external device. Interesting. Okay. Michael Heiss is saying, for the larger reel sizes, you usually used a pro machine such as a Scully 280, Ampex 350 or 440, or similar pro 24 or Red tracks. Ox or Studer product. Right. Uh, he says, uh, tracks used two tape, uh, but that's another story. Huh. Uh, Nick Danger saying, isolated loop tape decks, uh, Technics 1500 or 1520. Oh, God, those are sexy. <laughs> those are Big, tall machines, machined parts, they were sexy. <laughs> uh, let's see, Nick Danger saying, isolated loop tape decks, uh, or no, let's see, uh, 3M M series and Stevens trap out most capstan pulling errors. That's really cool stuff. I, I mean, I'm, the, the we're going to have to get us a reel-to-reel -reel machine. You know what? <laughs> you may have to go on another hunt for a VCR. Um, and let's open up a VCR because that's, oh, that's what I remember. Well, see, and that's helical scan. Remember the the head. Oh, yeah, is the at head's an at, at an angle. No, yeah, yeah, it's at an angle. Yeah, and what which causes the the I, I looked that up one time as to why they did that, but something basically they were it it solved uh, um, an issue that they were having with the video because originally they were when vertical. they were creating it they were vertical and then they they realized that if they did it just at an angle it would solve some problem I forget what it was. Um, vertical helical scan is what yeah. VHS stood for. Let's see, for crying out loud, Brent, in the day, in quotes, uh, all VTRs were tape. If you've ever used a two quad, you know what I'm talking about, or one inch helical scan or EIAJ deck. I'm, I've used the Sony reel to reels, and I don't remember the part numbers. Right. I used JVC U-Matic, which is the original video cassette. Sure. Big thing. Right. Um, and then the, the VHS as we know it now in beta. Two inch tape. Sorry, two inch tape. Um, Cut my teeth, okay. More than, uh, <laughs> and more than a few fingers on those. Two inch tape, so like two inch yeah, wide. Two, two inch tall. Two inch tall. But when you, when you get a, a measurement like that, it's the, that's the height. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the, and Because yeah. the data, they could not condense, they couldn't put the density on the tape. Right, so they had to, and more basically tape. just doubled up the tape right, then at that tape. point, right? More tape. That's really well, interesting outside. stuff. Now, well, okay, so for me... So do we need to do a, vi a history of recorded video episode? That would be pretty cool. If we can track down, like... like. Oh, I'm never going to find a U-Matic or Sony reel to reel. What about, like, a... Could we track down a, um, like, like a... What is it? An, an 8mm, an 88mm or something oh, those, like that? Oh, I've no, got, I've got 8mm digital video, VHS. Um, I think I can get my hands on a beta. Maybe we'll do an episode on that, because that would be pretty, if you can get a beta. Okay, okay. I've never if witnessed a beta. That, if we're going to step down that rule, do you remember video CD? I remember video CD. Yes. Not DVD. Correct. Yep. Video CD. Yep. Video CD. I remember. Okay. I remember because I made a video CD. I had my 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 parents got a new computer. It had a DVD a CD burner, and we had the option of creating a CD video. Now I created okay, no, no. one. CD video is different than video CD. CD video is was the first really low res movies. Okay, then Video no. CD was where I could make was it. Was from 1985, 86. Uh huh. And what you got was a short little three minute video <laughs> on a disc. Sure. And we had a couple of absolutes of Phillips had a player and somebody else. I don't remember. Right. Michael, get in touch with me. You've got my contact information. Give me a call or shoot me an email. We'll talk. Do you, do you remember the, uh, I, I think we talked about this the other day, the RCA video disc? Which was with the stylus. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we did talk about it, which stylus. is really cool. Really, uh, okay. So yeah, my favorite thing. An my favorite thing about all of these things that that there are, the digital world, the digital age that we're in when it comes to audio or video or hi-fi in general and stuff, it's really cool because we were doing some really awesome stuff with programming. However. Most of that's just typing up something new on a keyboard or a, a new chip that, you know, on the microscopic level is doing something different that the other stuff isn't doing. Back then, we were solving problems mechanically. physically, mechanically. mechanically. And it's a completely different world. Not, not, well, it's not a different, it's not a completely different world. It's just different mindset. You have to 
It and was it, hardware versus software. Yeah, in, in a digital world, you're you're dealing with it on a on a software base, and so if you want to make a change, you decompile the, the whatever it is, make the change, recompile everything, and run it through again and see what happens. Back then, you'd have to remachine an entirely new system. Yeah, change values on resistors, caps, yeah. diodes. Really cool stuff. Really, really cool stuff. You know, things like um, the, the quality of the capacitor, the polypropylene, the, the different mm -hmm. materials used in the capacitor would affect the fidelity. Yeah, yeah. The size of the toroid, the quality of the chassis. Um, heavy brass versus plastic, all that mattered to hi-fi. Yeah. Uh, oh, interesting. Uh, don't. I did see this. I did see this. Okay, so Michael Heiss is saying, um, don't forget before tape, which came oh, yeah. as a result, of, a result of, of work done by Germany during World War, uh, during the war, audio recording was done on wires. So it was just wrapped wires. Yes, we actually, when I worked at Absolute Sound in Orlando. Sure. We had a guy call us. He wanted to actually be able to find a way to take his wire recording, transcribe it onto cassette. Yes. Like, ah, bah, bah. That was on, um, yeah, it was on uh, uh, literally just a, 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 a it was like a, about the size of a, of a human hair. Just wire. And it was wrapped around and in, in wire. And it's fidelity, cause, but it's still, it's still magnetic impulses. Well, right, exactly. And it was the same idea as tape. It's just tape then took those... Uh, it took the, the grains on, on it and, and you know controlled it that way. It gave you more of it. Fascinating stuff. It really truly is. I mean, in in theory, you can today make a recording on a string like that yourself. By the way, if you want to see a wire recorder, mm -hmm. if you really want to see one, Hogan's Heroes. Ye they used yes. it in Hogan's Heroes. Did they really? To to um, Did they Clink's office. Okay. Hogan's Heroes. Why are recording? Go back and watch that. Okay, there you go. All right, guys, we are at uh, about 50 minutes now for our, for today's episode, so I think we need to go ahead and look at wrapping it up. Um, you got any more tech tips for this week? You know, honestly, I don't. I've taken I was thinking a number on it. of calls reference the AIO. Yep. Um, guys, if you haven't used one yet, get the AIO in stock that has the hot plug interrupt. Yep. Because it really does solve a lot of issues. If you have a control system, you just hook it right into your relay. You open and close the relay every time you change inputs. Mm -hmm. You open the relay when you turn the system off. So when you turn it on, you close it. It's a fresh hot plug reset, fresh right. negotiations. Everything's better. Yep. If you don't have a control system, the CS-IR kit CCUS that he's done a great video of yep. on the CS-IR kit CCUS page yep. allows you to have relay control with programming IR. Yes. So you can take any two commands and open and close the relay. Yeah. Right there on the box. So here's what I would like from you all uh, out there watching the videos today. Uh, and if you're watching this after it's been recorded and you're, you're coming into it uh, afterwards, put down in the comment section. Next week, we're talking about RCAs. I want to know what you think RCA means. Like, why Whoa. is it called RCA? But I want wrong answers only. Um, can you put photos in comments? Uh, no. Oh, don't. I don't believe so. Um, send us photos of your hi-fi. Yeah. yeah. Seriously. You've got our email addresses. Send them here. Uh, Adam.Rogers at MetroAV.com. Let, let, let us sit. Let us just, just get us excited. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then, of course, you can email Brent at Brent.McCall at MetroAV.com. And we are on Instagram. It's at AVTechTips. Uh, Ooh, on Instagram, that's a place to put so your you can photos. put them uh, put them on there. We do monitor that, and we do post stuff there periodically. So find us on there and follow us there as well. Uh, maybe we'll send you a, a, a follow back for that. Um, Share your hi-fi. I tell you what else I want to know: your favorite demo content. Yeah. When you're showing off your system to your buddy, mm -hmm. what's your go-to? Yeah, yeah. What's oh yeah? What what track do you put yeah. on? What you got a brand new audio system? What's the first thing you're listening to? That's that's what we're well, looking no, that's for. That's different than my show off. Is it? Oh, okay. hell yes. Okay. Is, is the first one you listen to a little bit more of something where you don't want anybody to know that this is the thing you listen to? Yeah, I, there, are some, there are some guilty pleasures. Well, I'm just saying, you, it's okay to say that it's you know, Backstreet Boys. It, well, if that's your go-to song... I can tell, you, I can tell song, you what it's not. I mean, yeah. I can promise you what it's not. <laughs> Anything after the 90s? Anything after 1989. <laughs> uh, There's not a single boy group. Right. Uh, but see, I'm not of that persuasion like well, some of us here. You know, so. Anyways. Yeah, I'm, it'd be, it would be, <laughs> honestly, the SACD version of Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Okay. The, the bass right. is it's just tremendous. Sure. Yeah. So let us know down in the comments below um, where, what you think RCA stands for. Um, and again, wrong answers only, please. 
Uh, and we've got one already. Nick Danger is saying, no, that, that's BNC. That's right. BNC. But he's saying it's the big, RCA, big, uh, big, big nasty, nasty connector. connector. Which, he's not wrong. No. I mean, you know. And by the way, the older <clears throat> you get, uh -huh. the, the worse those are. The, particularly with arthritis. Yeah. You know that? Have you seen gets... those tools that they have for those, though? It's a really cool, it, it, it's like a... Um, um, it's kind of an open-end wrench. That it, it, yeah, it, it's it, also, it they slides make over the wire. Connectors, yeah. yeah, oh, those are cool. Those are really cool. We need one of those. Um, anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching the video today. If you have more questions about whatever it is that we talked about today, Our ideas. Um, feel free to put it down into EWF, Edgar Winter, Winter Frankenstein. Frankenstein. What's EWF? Well, first off, it's Edgar Winter's group. Ah. It was Johnny and Edgar Winter. Okay. Um, albinos, the, the, the pink eyes, the, the white sure. skin, the white hair. Sure. Uh, the song Frankenstein. Oh, okay. You yeah. know the song. Uh, You've it's heard been it. forever since I've. Yeah. I've, I've, yes. uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, that one I do know. Okay. Leave us uh, down in the comment section below everything for that. And again, as always, if you have questions about whatever it was that we talked about today, leave that down in the comment section below as well. Uh, we will be back on Friday where we will talk about this guy here. This is our MHXD series uh, RCA cable. And we'll talk about- I appreciate about... you having it right there. Uh, yeah, right? I'm, I'm becoming more minute, and more prepared. Minute. What they don't get to see is who's behind that. Yeah, that's a, uh, yep. So um, what we'll do- So much you guys don't get to see. Uh, what we'll do is we'll talk about that. We'll tell you what's so special about it and why we think you should use it. But that's a day. That, that's an episode specifically about our products. We like to give you guys on Wednesday um, episodes about well on Fridays. On Wednesdays, we like to give you episodes about just general concepts. Yes, and next week again is the RCA terminal. Yep. The week after is Arc E Arc. Yep. And I believe we have coming one upcoming on how to deal with the contractor. Yeah, we uh, possibly, we're still working that out, right? Um, yeah. Once once we get that ironed out, we're gonna put it up on the schedule so you guys can see that as well. Um, I'll make sure the links to the rest of the, the, the videos are up as soon as possible. So as always, everybody, like, share, subscribe, hit that little bell notification to let you know when we do go live, which of course is every Wednesday and Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. So, Brent, what do we do? Adam, reboot early. Reboot often. Don't cut your wires too short. Uh, turn off CEC. Call tech support. And check all your stuff before and you walk never, away. And never program on a Friday. <laughs> Don't update on a Friday. Never update <laughs> on a Friday. <laughs> I'm Brent. I'm Adam. We're out of here. We'll see y'all next time. Let's see. Let's let those credits roll. Who Who's on those credits? We've got executive producer Brandon Gadis. We've got director for director. For, we've got everything Legacy else. Out of there you go. Legacy fellow. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see y'all next time.